John Barker here for Titan of Tech, virtual CIO advisory services. And today I wanna to break down the seven steps I use to set up remote work perfection for teams that I've run. Yes, it is absolutely possible to create a dynamic, cohesive, productive environment for a completely remote workforce. Now, obviously not everything can be set up for remote work, but if you're definitely in the technology field, which is whether you run a tech company or you work in tech, this is aimed for you. You absolutely can set up a remote work environment. Now, before we dive into the steps, you may wonder, what do I possibly know about setting up a remote work environment? Well, let me explain. I ran previously to COVID a large program that had a completely remote workforce. We had a worldwide footprint with over 450,000 users that we were supporting. And my team was also part of other organizations teams that we collaborate on where everybody was completely remote. Everybody was completely remote. So this is not pie in the sky. This is something that I've actually done and have done it successfully. The clients were ecstatic with the amount of support and the way our teams functioned the ingenuity and the creativity they were brought to, brought to the, the platforms that we were supporting. And again, nobody ever saw each other. Very rarely did we ever get together. It was completely a, work in my, a remote work environment. So let's start diving into how to set this up for your organization and also dispel a bunch of the nonsense that's out there because there's a lot of these Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies, the CEOs are are bringing people back into the office. You're seeing some smaller places want to mimic or imitate them, but it's a bunch of garbage. It's a bunch of nonsense that really doesn't have anything to do with productivity, but we'll get into that toward the end of this presentation. So <clears throat> let's define remote work first. It's not strictly just work from home. You can do it from a coffee shop. I've done it. Do it from the beach. I've tried it. Internet connectivity is a little flaky there, but definitely done it from a beach house. Or even grandma's kitchen. You know, you're home for the holidays. We just got over that, you know, as I'm recording this in January 2024. Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's at grandma's house, baking some cookies. Got your phone up, got your laptop up. No problem. This does not necessarily mean strictly working from your own home office. It truly means to be able to be transient. You know, being able to get a high level of productivity, get your everything done but not necessarily just from one other location that's just not a central office. The other thing too is this may not necessarily mean it's a flexible schedule. For a lot of people, yes, it absolutely can be. If you've got stuff where you get up early, I like to get up pretty early, work for a couple hours, then go work out. That, you know, that works for me. Other people, you may have to still man a support center or a call center, something along that line where you still have to find work hours. You're just able to do that from home. So maybe you have a flexible schedule, maybe not. So it's just one of those things to keep in the back of the mind when we're starting to talk about what exactly does remote work mean. So let's start diving into some of the steps that I use to structure the teams that I had in play. So we were actually were performing at a super, super, super high level. So the next, the first thing is everybody's got to have a measurable outcome. So this could be at the individual level or this could be set based on the team. So there kind of usually be two. Each, each individual person would have their own key metric that they have to do, and the team would have goals to set out that they would have to accomplish. We want to sit there and keep that to one to three, maybe one to three for each category. One for the individual, you know, you got somebody that's more skilled, they can do more, and also one or two for the team as a whole because you want everybody to still have that, that singular point, that singular goal that they're aiming for. So it's one of those things to keep in mind because what's get measured, what gets measured gets managed. And we want to make sure that we're always trying to increase the productivity that we're doing and also keeping the quality up at the same time. Speed for speed's sake and just to get stuff done, it's not good. What do you think all the support centers uh, are awful? We ever, <laughs> you ever call one of them and you get put on hold forever? Uh, the answer is you get bounced around and all that kind of stuff and because because the person on the other end of the line is getting tracked because their call was one second over what it was supposed to be. Yeah, you don't want somebody sitting on there and giving their life story for 45 minutes, but at the same time, to have an arbitrary number just to speed through stuff, it's not good for quality and it kind of gets everybody irritated. Everybody's in a rush and the customer at the end of the day is not happy. 
So you got to remember that Parkinson's law work expands to fill time. So a lot of the stuff is going to be time based when it comes to productivity. But at the same time, there's a there's a balance in there that you're going to have to experiment with over time. The second step on here is centralized dashboard. So after you've defined what your team as a whole and as the individual, the couple of metrics that need to be tracked, they you need a place to put them. It needs to be publicly publicly visible to your entire team. Some sort of web based, you know, it can be a Google sheet that is shared amongst your team. It can be something that is completely accessible by higher level managers, as well as every single person on your team. And nothing should be hidden. That keeps public accountability. It's because nobody wants to be the weak link. It, it kind of gamifies scorekeeping in the job. And if people, you know, nobody wants to be that last, you know, that bottom producer. Also, it shows who needs maybe additional training where things are kind of slipping through the cracks. And also, by having a centralized dashboard, it keeps just dumb meetings down. I found that this really cut down on standardized meetings, the length of time. We may still have had some remote meetings, but instead of them taking 45 minutes, maybe it was 10 minutes. Because all of the key metrics that we're tracking, anybody could click on them at any time of the day. There was nothing hidden from anybody, which also led into a public communication platform. So people could sit there and communicate because we were having an operation that was 24 seven, 365. There was no days off for anybody. So by, we had an open source platform that was free that kind of was our centralized dashboard as well as communication. So our team members could talk to each other, but you can use something like Slack or Discord to just to keep up to date with the projects, ask questions, particularly for those things that are non-vital. Something that other team members have accessibility to. Not everything needs to be one-on-one -on -one private communication. You want to build that cohesive team when they don't have face-to-face. -face. They need a way to talk to each other as a group. Maybe somebody has experienced something that would affect every other person on the team. Or maybe there was some sort of oddball situation that, that threw out there that they need to describe the situation and get feedback and input from other members of your team. Having one of those a public communication platform absolutely critical critical to keeping your team cohesively working together when they're not sitting shoulder to shoulder. You need to have one-to-one -one communication. A lot of the platforms we mentioned before, Discord, uh, Slack, you got email, Zoom, those types of things as the manager to set up those times when you need to have one-to-one -one communication. One of the things that I always did was stay in touch with my strongest performers more. Those were the ones that usually brought the little more creative solutions. They were recognizing patterns of things that were starting to degrade and they're like, hey, here's ways we can improve this or this isn't starting to work anymore. And so I would spend more time with them to get those inputs so we could push the programs that we were working forward and bring new ideas to the table that would make things better for everybody. Now, one of the other things we're going into after you've got your communication down with your team is you may want to get together in person. You may want to set up a quarterly meeting that you bring everybody in. Or I usually did twice a year if it was feasible for everybody to get together. Again, our operation was 24-7, 365. So it was kind of hard to get 100% of everybody together. But it was one of those types of things that we did do that option so people could go and hang out and do fun. But the one of the things where it wasn't forced fun. Definitely do not do forced fun. Don't be an ass about it. Don't sit there and force somebody to come in on an off hours when they're you know supposed to be off, not supposed to be working to do and make sure this is done on company time, on company dime. Because there are so many times that you, you've, maybe you've seen this in other companies, even in in-person, where it's like, all right, now we gotta go do this thing on a Saturday for four hours and we gotta drive an hour and 40 minutes because somebody thought this would be cool to set together. And it's that thing of it's not mandatory, but it kinda is. Yeah, stay away from that stuff. You want to put a company event together, and I would say the usually the outside exception to that is maybe a, a a Christmas holiday party type of situation, but just your random event in April because you want to get everybody together. Maybe it's cool. Maybe everybody will enjoy it. Make sure it's not forced fun in the in the process. The other thing too is not just tracking motion. Activity has nothing to do with results. Activity has nothing to do with productivity. Activity is just activity. So you want to make sure that the work being done aligns with the company's goals, aligns with those key metrics that were defined, and somebody is not sitting there doing a lot of stuff that doesn't integrate into what the overarching mission of what you're supposed to do is. So it's one of those things, there's there's tons of tracking software out there. I've seen and heard, I've seen this personally, 
as well as heard about it from others where let's say you're using Microsoft Teams as your communication platform. Well, Teams will color code who's online. So you can sit there and say red, they're busy or do not disturb. Yellow is maybe they're away. Green, they're actively online. And I've seen managers who absolutely had nothing to do and they were just plain awful. were sitting there tracking. Oh, they're yellow now. Oh, they're red now. You know, type of stuff to try to determine if that activity had anything to do with them actually being productive. They were sitting at the computer doing this. It's, it's absolutely a waste of time, particularly with the bulk of you are probably going to be working in a small business anyway. Set up key, again, going circling back to that key tracking. What are the metrics that the people need to be doing to accomplish the goals and missions of the organization? Not just tracking motion, not just tracking activity, which feeds into the last thing. Now, it didn't really it didn't play for most of my team when we were doing remote work, but it was don't track the clock. And what here's what I mean by that. When you're working on the network engineering side of the house, there are those times where, yeah, maybe it's a nine to five, something along that line. But you've got those periods where the system's got to come down. Somebody's going to have to you know, work at an off hours time where there's reduced capacity on the system to patch the system. Or maybe they're deploying code, new system into the updates. And maybe that's something that you have scheduled every two weeks. Well, in, instead of making you know that thing of, oh, oh no, somebody's worked... 40 hours this week, but they're also going to have to stay, uh, you know, the night to work another five or six. Don't just track the clock, track what needs to be done. There's a, a thing in project management called critical chain path. And what happens is you literally cannot do the next thing until the previous work is done. So if you've got people on your team that cannot literally move forward because they're waiting for that next milestone to be hit, cut them loose, let them go because they're going to end up making that up. And probably then some I've seen that on way too many projects, tech projects to deploy, where it's like, oh, hey guys, you know, I just take Thursday and Friday off because we're we're gonna have some long days next week. Don't just sit there and have them sit there for the sake of sitting there because somebody arbitrarily said, don't just track the clock. And these are things when I was working for other organizations that I would just do on my own. See people saying this now that may have worked for me or didn't realize that. But again, my team had the productivity, the results, the client backing, excellent ratings to back up the steps that I put into place that others were trying to emulate. And this was kind of the steps behind the secret sauce behind all that stuff. Now that you got those seven steps and follow those, find what fits your organization. Let's talk a little bit about some of this nonsense you're seeing in the news and other organizations about coming back to the office. That this, this the companies are sitting there going, in person is more productive. That's a bunch of junk. There are so many HR studies that are out there. There are so many other um, reports from like, you know, your entrepreneur magazine, things of that nature that have done studies on this stuff. In person does not make things more productive. In person is just another way to work. Matter of fact, most studies say the opposite. That's because there's no, if you just bring everybody to the office, there's no guarantee that they're sitting at their desk just because you physically know that they badged in on the system and you can see, oh yeah, Tommy's here today. Great. He must be working. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. Again, it comes back to what's getting done. It comes back to where you can go back to Tommy and go, hey, man, these these five things were due, you know, and none of them are done. So what difference does it make where they're doing it at? Exactly. So there are, again, there are software out there where there is some extreme tracking going on that would make it to me a hostile work environment. I was reading some information about some financial institutions that you had to turn your web camera on, you had to turn your microphone on. There were you, every little action, how much your eye movement was on your computer screen, how much your conversations were, everything was being tracked. And if you fell outside of whatever the norm was, you could get reprimanded for that. That is absolutely not a place I want to be in and has really nothing to do with product, productivity. You want something like that, that's where your AI robots are going to come into play. That's going to be where that type of stuff goes because I don't know about you, I'm not a robot. I can't sit at the computer without having to get up and move around a little bit. Another one is an, another reason is behind uh, return to office. You'll see that RTO return to office. I think it has a lot to do with boosting real estate value, particularly in your cities. I've seen studies and reports there. San Francisco in particular, one of the most expensive cities in the country, if not the world to live in. A lot of their tax revenue is dried up because real estate values are down because the occupancy rate of those buildings is empty. 
So it's one of those situations where they're trying to get businesses. You got to bring your people back into the office to boost that real estate value because they want to get the tax revenue in there because that million dollar, that, that building that was worth a million dollars, you know, before COVID may now be worth 750, 600, 500, because it's being vacant all the time. Another reason for these return to office companies that don't want to do like announced layoffs, they know that by forcing people to come back into their office, it is going to make them lose employees. That is something that they want. We're seeing this all the time in the tech sector now. So many tech companies are laying people off. Now your big guys, your Fortune 500 probably, it may go strictly in, a little bit into the plan. They're more likely to sit there and announce, you know, a 5% workforce reduction, a 10% workforce reduction. But you're also seeing this as another way to, to get some attrition within the workforce and make them cut and run. And I think the last thing, and I think this has more to do I don't know about the large businesses, but definitely your smaller ones. It's your insecure leadership. The ones that feel like they, the people are not being as productive if they can't touch them on the shoulder and do their thing. It's a bunch of garbage. Those are the type of places, if you're seeing that type of workforce, and I've seen that in about three different places, you need to cut and run. You need to go look for something else. So I hope that helps. Use my seven steps. Structure your remote team that way. You're going to get the results you're looking for. The trust will build with your employees and the benefits that they're going to get from not having to commute more family time, more downtime is going to pay off because again, we're not robots. We're not, you know, yes, I think we're here to, to provide value to the world and to your families, but it doesn't mean you have to sacrifice everything for a bunch of nonsense people that don't know what's going on. So the next one.